Greetings. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, boy. You guys can tell that spring is here because my allergies are in full season. My name is Owen Taylor, and I have the pleasure of being the pastor here at Beaver Dam and Rousey's Chapel. And what a great day that we can come together and worship God together today. Um, if you happen to be joining us live on Facebook this morning or throughout the day, drop us a line there in the comment box. It's a great way for us to stay connected as the body of Christ. It's a great place to put your prayer concerns and your praises, those places where you've seen God active in your lives. So friends, uh, let's start our time together by bringing in the light of Christ and lighting a candle as a physical reminder that God is here with us in our worship space. <clears throat> I'd love spring allergies. <laughs> <coughs> Well, let us open with a word of prayer this morning. Let us pray. God, break open our hearts this morning to hear your word. Let our fears be vanquished. Let our spirits be restored. Come and let us worship you with great joy. Let us drop the things of the past which have weighed us down. God, it's all about you doing something new in our lives. Let you, we want your spirit to fill us so that we can become strong in our faith in you. God, we ask for all of these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Well, friends, our first reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Listen to these inspired words from God. Write this letter to the to the uh, write this to the angel of the church in Lacedonia. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witnesses, the ruler of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So you've become so because you are lukewarm. And neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. After all, you say, I am rich, and I've grown wealthy, and I don't need a thing. You don't realize that you're miserable, pathetic, poor, blind, and naked. My advice is that you buy gold from me that has been purified by fire, so that you may be rich and white and white clothing to wear so that your nakedness won't be shameful, shamefully expo exposed and the ointment to be put on your eyes so that you may see. I correct and discipline those whom I love. So be earnest and change your hearts and lives. Look, I am standing at the door and knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come Come in and be with them, and we'll have dinner with them, and they will have dinner with me. As for those who emerge victorious, I will allow them to sit with me on my throne, just as I emerge victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. If you can hear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And then our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Listen to these inspired words from the gospel writer. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And Lazarus, his, and Lazarus and his sisters hosted a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who joined them at the table. When Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard, she anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet and dried it dried with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. 
Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, complained. This perfume is worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would take, and would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, Leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Friends, for the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, the tree pollens are, are getting to me today. <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to say this is Tina and I, but I am sure that you might be able to relate to this conversation between a husband and a wife. Dear, where would you like to go eat? Oh, I don't care. Anywhere will be fine. Well, how about Chinese or Italian? Either is fine. Really, it doesn't matter. Okay, fine. So they end up going to Mexican. And after the meal is over, one of them says, you know, I really could have gone for a good cheeseburger. This conversation sure does bring to light what it is like when we are lukewarm about things that are going on around us. And really, when you think about it, who likes things to be lukewarm? How many, how many folks like room temperature coffee or room temperature soda or tea? Lukewarm is just meh, not really good and not yet really bad. It's almost as if you're just comfortable with the way things are, complacent, not really excited for or against what's going on. You're in that state of being neutral. You know, like some of you out there, I'm sure you've been watching a fair amount of basketball during March Madness. And one of the things that I have noticed during the tournament is how the teams and those in the crowd react as the game goes on. The folks in the stands during the game are at times cheering and at other times, not so much. It's fairly quiet compared to when your favorite team plays on their home court. The fans of the game are just there watching the game, not fully invested with what's going on, especially if the score is really lopsided. They're kind of neutral. Now the player is playing the game, that is a different story. You can tell that they are really into the game. They're hanging on every detail, cheering on their fellow teammates enthusiastically as the game goes, go, goes on. They are really following the game. And if they're winning, their excitement is catching. And if they're losing big time, well, there's an inconsolable sadness because their season is about to end. This difference between and being a lukewarm fan and being a true follower of the game brings us to the text from Revelation today. In today's text, we read about the church of Lacedonia. The people of Lacedonia were wealthy because it was a trade town and they were big manufacturers of the linen, of wools and textiles. And according to one commentary, they were so wealthy that when an earthquake destroyed the city, the people used their own wealth to rebuild it without any assistance from the Roman state. They lived in relative comfort, safety, and security due to their wealth. <clears throat> but they were also struggling. Struggling because they know who Jesus was and is but they aren't living that way. They aren't fully engaged as followers of Christ. John pins this letter to the church of Lacedonia from a vision that he received from God. 
In his letter, John speaks to the church and points out to, to the Lacedonians that they are deceiving themselves, that they think they're rich because of their physical wealth, but they are actually living in a spiritual poverty. They think they don't need things because they can provide for their physical needs. But Jesus says that they are truly indeed blind and naked. That they do not see what God sees in their hearts and lives. And they're not clothed in Christ. Most troubling of all, Jesus calls them lukewarm. Now, this reference of, to being lukewarm was a reference to the quality of the water in Lacedonia. The water in Lacedonia was not very good. The long aqueducts that carried the water to the town were filled with limestone deposits and were so far away from the mountains and the hot springs in the area that the water would arrive in the town lukewarm. And just like today, cold water was seen as refreshing and they saw the hot water from the hot springs as relaxing and therapeutic for their bodies. Lukewarm water was seen as almost useless. By being described as lukewarm, Jesus is pointing to, out to the church that they have gotten too comfortable, a little lazy, and are no longer really following Jesus as they did when they first believed. In other words, they were just going through the motions. They're not living into the great commission of making disciples of all the nations. Being lukewarm is not a good place to be, and it might even be a little dangerous. Dangerous because Jesus tells them, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. What a place to be. Friends, if we're not careful and intentional and committed to a life of following Christ, we too can fall into that lukewarm, comfortable place with the Lacedonians. Now, I know that each of us are in a different place in our faith journey and in our relationship with God. But what I want us to think about are those blind spots that we all have from time to time and to admit that sometimes we do fall into the lukewarm, comfortable fan category and that we are not fully engaged as a committed follower of Jesus, the type of follower that we desire to be. Now things do change and situations change and I don't know what troubles you're facing today. You may not be able to do what you once did or you might have a lot going on that takes out have a lot going on in your life that takes up a lot of time or maybe you have just simply fallen into a rut and you need to find help in getting your way out of it there are all sorts of ways that pull us from being followers of Jesus what is pulling you from being a completely a complete follower of Jesus today You know, the biggest issue that the church is facing today has nothing to do with some hot topic picked from the news media headlines. The main problem that the church is facing today is, is that it's simply lukewarm. That for us to be a true follower of Christ, we must fight the urge to get comfortable with where we are currently. And how do we avoid getting too comfortable with our faith? The text gives us some guidance from today. For the Lacedonians, we read that Jesus is standing at the door knocking. He tells us that if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come to be with them and I will have dinner with them and they will have dinner with me. Y'all, for this to happen, the Lacedonians had to be willing to open the door all the way not just peeking through the curtain or looking through the peephole, but flinging that door wide open with that big old come on in type greeting. For when this happens, as Jesus tells them, he enters their lives fully and completely. 
and will be sitting with Jesus on his throne right next to the Father. Now, for the original hearers of the word, this type of following might have been a little tough because this following means that they need to confront the hard realities that they had indeed missed the mark of being true followers, that they had indeed become lukewarm, that they weren't as great and self-sufficient as they thought they were, were. This might have been hard for them, but it was the truth, and they needed to hear the truth. But all is not lost. There is still good news for them because Jesus knows that there's still hope for them to change. The text tells us that Jesus says, I correct and discipline those whom I love. So be earnest and change your hearts and lives. You know, this news, this same good news, this same promise from Jesus is true for us today. Even though it may be hard for us to see our blind spots and confront the areas of our lives where we are failing and see the ways that we've gotten too comfortable in our faith, Jesus is still knocking at the door. He's knocking because he loves each one of us. And he has hope that we will hear, listen, and open the door and enter either for the first time or for the thousandth time. You know, there are times when I wish I could tell you that if you did this, that God would do this. Shoot, I wish it was that way for me. But that's not the way God works. How it does work is us taking on a part of discernment. It takes a lot of discernment, it takes a lot of prayer, and it takes a commitment to Christ. Not what we think Christ wants or what other people tell us that we should do, but a, but a commitment to Jesus. A commitment to follow and to be the one that God wants us to be. God wants us, what God wants us to be is going to be different for each one of us because each one of us has different gifts and graces. But there is one thing that should be universal for all of us, and that, my friends, is passion. A passion to love God. A passion that will carry us forth so that we are not lukewarm but that we are a committed, complete follower of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, during this season of Lent, we have been taking time to reflect upon uh, the message, and I encourage you to reflect upon uh, this during the day. Seek the Holy Spirit and ask the Lord to help you not to be lukewarm. Well, friends, I hope you have enjoyed our time together this morning. If you have, I invite you to hit the like and share button there on Facebook. And uh, just as a reminder, there's a way, there are ways that you can help us continue um, our ministries here in Beaverdam uh, by uh, going to our website and giving online or uh, just sending us your tithes and offerings. Uh, either way, we will use them with great stewardship so that we can continue to carry out the, the mission that we've been given. So friends, for now, uh, let us leave this time together. Let us go into the world and be ready to take on uh, the challenges of the day. Receive this benediction. Friends, God calls us not to be lukewarm, but to have passion and to have love for him and for others. Friends, let's do that. Let's go into the love and show them how hot we are filled with the spirit for Jesus. Go with the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.